Welcome back to the Nutra Medical Report, and we have a dynamic show for you today. In hour number one, Christina Consolo and her uh, website and her Facebook pages are chock-a-block full of amazing information regarding the consequences of the worst environmental disaster in human history, Fukushima. 100,000 people protested in Japan over the weekend in Tokyo against nuclear power. Most of the 67-plus uh, uh, Japanese uh, foreign embassies have been picketed for the last number of months around the world to stop nuclear power, especially in Japan, and they've also been burning radioactive waste, averaging it. One of our top experts and activists in the world now is Christina Consolo. And, uh, Christina, you have a number of websites and blogs. I'm going to post all of them up, but what's your main one? Uh, the main one would be FukushimaFacts.com, where we have links to all of the Facebook pages, uh, my Twitter, my uh, radiation fallout forecast, YouTube channel. Uh, we're just trying to use social media in every way possible. And it also includes a link to a Tumblr page that we started for mutations that are being found in plants throughout Canada, the U.S., and Europe. Um, this was something that I visualized in my area. I live in southeast Michigan, and I started noticing mutations in plants in young oak saplings and in weeds and mushrooms last July, wow. which uh, really put me on alert. So we created a Facebook page called Mutation Watch where people can upload their own images, and then we put them into a Tumblr account so researchers can grab images from there and use them in, in any of their studies, in any of their lectures. What would be a good idea, actually, coming out of the Tumblr pages for people to know how to get uh, a proper transfer container uh, and get a lyophilized or dry specimen of the plant uh, so they can actually do genetic analysis? If they can get it under scanning EM, they can see if there's heteroptopic DNA, which is the best sign, or micronuclei, the best uh, sign, physical signs under scanning EM, that there's mutagenic activity occurring because a lot of people, especially the Environmental Poisoning Agency, the EPA or the International Atomic Energy Agencies and the United Nations, they totally ignore this fact. They totally mm -hmm. ignore the amount of radiation that's going on. And even uh, activists like uh, Senator Wyden, I'm absolutely appalled that I haven't heard an answer back. Now, of course, I, you just told me this morning before the show that Senator Wyden's office probably won't respond if you don't live in the state. But uh, my son does. He lives in Portland, and he's actually going to, to the, uh, the Natural College of, National College of Natural Medicine up there and finishing his uh, math degree. So what I suspect is uh, I'll have to go through and have my son contact him if he's not going to respond to me. Uh, I presented this idea about doing radiation detection using aircraft, but this problem has already released hundreds of times more radiation than Chernobyl. And that means, uh, according to Dr. Bernhoft, we presented this a few weeks ago, who's a past president last year of the American Academy of Environmental Medicine, uh, has already poisoned people to the point where every single individual tested in their urine showed radioactive thorium here in California, and he checked with his colleagues across the country in the academy, and every other doctor doing urine testing has detected thorium. So everyone, not without exception, has some level of radioisotopes, strontium, cesium, thorium, americium, all these radioisotopes are now bioaccumulating, and, of course, we just uh, reported last week the Japanese study of California almonds showing 0 0.02 becquerels per kilogram in California almonds. 100% of the bluefin tuna uh, cut off of San Diego has been poisoned with radioactive strontium. Uh, it just goes on and on. And this idea that, and cesium, and the, uh, this idea that uh, we're, quote, quote, safe and we're just going to have maybe a slow increase over the next five years of doubling the radiation is a fairy tale. Exactly. I agree. Yeah, it's really an obscene fairy tale. And, of course, we lack data. We want to have concrete data so we neither exaggerate things nor play it down or um, realize that certain segments of the population, the unborn, which are 10 million to 100 billion times more sensitive to radiation, uh, and the elderly or anybody with any serious illness or a weakened tissue, let's say a stealth infection of TB or anything else, this also increases the risk of plagues. We've already had the release now of resistant TB and rubella in Japan. 
and I expect we're going to have multiple plagues coming out of the radiation toxic zones where the weakened population is a perfect host to develop super bacteria and viruses. Yes, and that's a lot of people, you know, are only concerned with cancer, getting cancer from this down the road, but there are so many other conditions <laughs> well, that they, come up. I did an analysis of the of the Chernobyl disaster, and it, it was apparent that in Chernobyl, most of the people would be lucky if they got cancer because most of them died of vascular disease because most people don't realize oxidative stress, the first thing that happens is cortical damage to the brain, so you become decorticate, especially the frontal lobes are highly metabolically active. You develop eye problems, radiation retinopathies, and cataract changes and you develop the changes to any highly metabolic tissues, including mitochondria, immune system failure, and the most common things are actually vascular disease early on, like heart attacks and strokes. So people acutely exposed after Chernobyl, many of the young men died in their 20s and 30s of heart attacks and strokes and other vascular events like deep vein thrombosis and pulmonary embolism. They didn't live long enough to get cancer. And we're, and we're starting to realize, too, that cesium has almost immediate, immediate effects on the heart muscle. Oh yeah, you can give enough uh, radioactive cesium because because cesium is a very powerful beta emitter uh, and gamma emitter. What it does is it immediately displaces potassium and causes a toxic effect in the conduction bundles and can cause cardiac arrhythmias or a toxic tachyarrhythmia that can be almost immediately fatal. So if there's a massive surge in cesium, 137, you can have a whole bunch of people that are teetering and most people realize by the time you get into the seventh decade, 10% of the population have got chronic atrial fibrillation, which is a major yeah, contributor to death. And, and so many people don't realize a lot of these studies that are just coming to light, too, are only measuring one or two different isotopes when there were hundreds of isotopes that were released from the reactors. Exactly. So... Yeah, so tell us all about your, your, your journey on this whole process because obviously you mentioned this morning that you have come around the corner. You, you used to be a, a booster years ago for nuclear. Then you realized exactly what was going on. Tell us what, what's your transformation and what, how this happened. And you're now one of the, I would say, primary lightning rods for it because I know Joel Skousen came up with a very blazing negative uh, comment in his journal against uh, some videos and material you put it posted up about the dangers of Fukushima cooling pool 4 and the disaster to the northern hemisphere. Uh, I've uh, actually had our nuclear expert uh, Chris Harris on and Chris Harris has quoted the radiation uh, physicist who actually did the full analysis and published it in April on what would happen from Fukushima and just if 10% of the cooling pool fuel rod assemblies, 1535 of which if only 10% go, the amount of radiation released in the next major burp, I call it, will be 10 to, uh, we're sorry, 30 to 100 times the amount of released radiation. And if 100% of the fuel rod assemblies, that doesn't even include the other parts of the plant, go, all at once we will have the release of 3,000 times more radiation than was previously released last year. And what was released last year is at least 100 to 200 times more than Chernobyl. So we're dealing with a global catastrophe of Biblical proportions. Yeah, the, the reason I, I started to become involved in, in researching this was I was very alarmed at the beginning of the disaster when I couldn't find any current information on Fukushima and any of the normal mainstream news sources, CNN and, and BBC. In fact, I got rid of my television a few weeks after the disaster so that I could just research full time, and I had been intensely interested when Chernobyl happened, um, and, and using, I mean, we have so much research from Chernobyl that we can, you know, extrapolate, and, and a lot of this was assuming, yes, we are going to have contamination, um, especially in the food supply, and this is a huge concern with, you know, children and how profoundly they are affected by it. I mean, it's bad enough for the adults, but for, for children or for pregnant women, um, it, it's just it, it's unspeakable that this isn't being talked about at you know the uh, level of the Academy of Obstetrics. They're not warning pregnant women not to fly um, or to do any type of mitigation. They're not warning them against eating seafood. And no. um, you know part of that is just doing doing phone calls, doing a radio show. We try to teach people you don't need to be a physicist for scientists to understand this stuff, what you need to yeah. know is all radiation is bad, and there's easy ways to avoid it, low-cost. Exactly. Back, back in a moment. 
Welcome back, and uh, Christina, let's, let's walk through some of the latest information you've posted up and the most powerful uh, responses you've had from people and comments uh, on various networks. I'm sure you're being asked to come on some of the major networks, too, uh, on the what I call the snoozetainment, or the, the I call it the snooze, because they try to put people to sleep. They don't want people to know that if they're flying, for example, to the friendly skies, they may actually be flying through a radioactive plume, and there's going to be an averaging or dissipation of radiation from Fukushima as it circulates the planet many times, but there's also going to be giant plumes. And let's say at 26,000 to 31,000 feet, there's a plume with X number of becquerels per cubic meter of space. If you're flying in at 547 miles an hour and now concentrating that plume because you're flying at 30,000 feet or 25,000 feet and enter that plume, you have to compress that air down to 8,000 foot average height equivalent so that means maybe that air is going to be compressed eight times. So if it's X number, you can take 8X for the amount of radiation you're going to be exposed to, counting the number of breaths per minute and number of mils per respiration. You're going to be swallowing and breathing a hell of a lot of radioactive fleas, which means uh, we may not have bad dry cleaning for the airlines, uh, stewards and stewardesses, not just from uh, Alaska Airlines. I'm now hearing reports that American Airlines and others are now reporting to sickness. I would expect... Um, Immune suppression, hair and skin changes, respiratory problems, uh, nasal bleeds, GI tract problems as the radioactive fleas get in their GI tract and cause holes and just suppress what's called the crypt cells in their villi. So I, I, I can give them a laundry list of what I expect could happen in someone who's exposed to what I call some acute radiation sickness. Mm -hmm. And I think that we may not have bad dry cleaning, but we may have radioactive plumes that are pilots airline stewards and stewardesses are flying to, and although they have higher radiation levels because they're closer to the sun or cosmic background radiation, and you can look at the NOAA reports from 2007, which I posted about a month ago, it's very evident to me that we don't have any data that tells us exactly what it is. So I flew to Portland a month ago to visit my son in Portland, Oregon, and I did took my Inspector Plus radiation detector and took GPS uh, photos with my iPad and iPhone Siri S, and uh, I was freaked out when I saw how fast it rose. And when I flew back, it rose even faster, and then it dropped off about a half an hour into the flight back to half normal, which means it was a giant plume of radiation north, which is an order, and, and the plume was not present from southern Cali from northern California down to where the land or was significantly less. So that we're seeing giant plumes of radiation, and no one's tracking them, mapping them, and we need to know where the hell they are because if it's high enough, we may literally have a civil defense disaster where, uh, you know, in Israel they had to take people's windows off because they thought back in the Gulf War with Saddam Hussein, he might send rockets and with chemical weapons or biological weapons. Well, we could have a radiation disaster where the radiation levels could be so high that just going out acutely and breathing in the outside air during a radiation plume for a matter of a few hours in an afternoon might permanently affect your health. Yeah, some, something that I had started um, focusing on quite a bit is, is where these, uh, where the numbers are coming in high, how it relates to the jet stream, and what is seems to be an even larger factor in the amount of fallout that we're receiving is the tropopause, which is a very dynamic area of our atmosphere where all of our storms are generated out of. Um, there's a, a couple of groups that are using crowdsourced data, and I put together a forecast three times a week of where... I think the highest levels of fallout may be. We find that um, ahead of these storm systems and trailing behind them seems to be the, the highest number. Um, it's getting pushed out ahead of some of these storms. Did you corroborate any of your numbers when you were flying with the jet stream? Uh, yeah, I looked at the jet stream, and it appears that the jet stream was further north, and in fact it was over Oregon and Washington State, and it's exactly what I suspected is that the jet stream tends to push these plumes ahead of it, or it hits the boundary zone of the jet stream and bunches up against it. But that's only conjecture. If we don't have data, we actually can't do 3D modeling or 4D modeling to see exactly what's happening. So let's say, theoretically, if we had 100 airlines uh, putting up jets across the Pacific Ocean, across Alaska, and we have to also know that can, plumes can go over the the uh, Arctic Circle. Mm -hmm. That we, if we we could then identify the the you know how many knots or miles per hour the uh, plume is going or kilometers per hour, we could know the Becquerel concentration, how large the plume is in terms of the boundary zone, what the average concentration of Becquerels per kilogram per cubic uh, 
meter it is, and uh, what's the likely concentration inside the airline cabin, uh, considering the findings that they have, and also the isotope analysis that we have something like a little uh, capsule that would pick up just like the radon capsules that are used to measure radon in homes, but they should have a chain of custody and air sampling that occurs when they hit certain action points when the number of millisieverts per hour counts per minute goes over a level that's beyond, way beyond background uh, and way beyond what we'd expect even if you're having a solar storm because solar storms can generate much higher levels of background radiation. But uh, we're, we're not hearing anything from uh, the uh, airline stewards organization. If you're listening and you're an airline steward, you need to take, pay attention. We want to help you. We want to get data. But even UC Berkeley has stopped responding last year after me having contact with them. No other universities are picking up the ball. Uh, the Environmental Poisoning Agency, the EPA, are useless. They should be fired, and I agree with Ron Paul on that. And the International Atomic Energy Agency is trying to whitewash it, along with the uh, our government, including Obama, who thinks that nuclear power is green, when it's only green when you're dead, because you're already because rigor mortis is setting in. Nuclear power is not green, unless it's tokamak fusion reactors, and the more advanced type nuclear reactors uh, are even still dangerous. That are thorium or or thorium or pebble bed reactors are developed in South Africa. So. Uh, what I see is a conspiracy of silence and, and a conspiracy of inaction when they know this is going to basically like be like the movie eight or nine years ago that came out called uh, uh, Children of Men, where basically the last young person died and everybody on earth mourned because no woman either could have a pregnancy or would dare to have one. Yeah, I'm, I'm also um, upset with the lack of information that's coming from a lot of our um, cancer organizations. In fact, just two weeks ago, I called the Canadian Cancer Society, the American Cancer Society. I called um, UCLA, Tech School of Medicine, California Pacific Medical Center. And I know people that work at all of these institutions. There's nothing on their website um, about low-level, long-term radiation effects on health from Fukushima. The only place that I could find any information was on the CDC's website. But the information they have is only for the immediate effects of a meltdown if you are in the evacuation zone. There's nothing for long-term health effects. And you know, But even, the, even their information on the immediate treatment is dated back to the uh, Cold War days of the 50s and 60s. It's completely out of date. Mm-hmm. And a lot of people think that Chernobyl just affected Russia, but... You know, they've had um, increases in thyroid cancer and other conditions in Belarus, the Ukraine, Turkey, Greece, uh, Romania, Bulgaria. Romania is quite a bit south, too. Um, Finland, Denmark, Norway. I mean, the, the list is just endless. And, and their levels of allowable contamination in food, I believe, is 37 becquerels per kilogram. And these children that are eating this food, um, young children have the GI tracts of a 70-year-old. They have exactly. terrible immune problems. Yeah, it's amazing, isn't it? And, of course, it causes cortical atrophy of the higher centers of the brain, so those neural pathways aren't even laid down. Welcome back. And, uh, Christina, you mentioned some very important facts in terms of what you're detecting because there's a bunch of radiation networks like RadNet, etc., that after the wildfires in California, in Colorado and elsewhere, there were some interesting findings. Can you expand on that, please? Well, you know, just some of the highest numbers that we have seen in the last few weeks um, may be attributable to the wildfires that have been going on out west. And another uh, thing that we know from Chernobyl, in fact, they asked for help from world governments uh, a few years ago in helping decontaminate their forests because anytime there's a forest fire, radiation gets re-released through the forest fires and that could also be happening in the U.S. now and the reason I say that is because we do have some uh, initial soil contamination numbers from the USGS, however they're from I believe April 5th of 2011 so they're, they're horribly out of date but some of the highest contamination was found in Los Angeles, in Portland, and in Boulder, Colorado. And, you know, that's where a, a lot of these fires were happening. And those plumes from the fires, and so we had air quality alerts here in Wisconsin, Minnesota, in Michigan, in Indiana. We've seen numbers go up um, ever since then. 
and uh, it, it could be that the radiation is getting re-released from the burning of these trees. Right. Now the mines are notorious for cesium uptake. Yes. In fact, uh, what happens is people should realize that most of the radiation released in the in the uh, black current or the you know humble current we call it that comes from Japan splits and goes north toward Alaska and south toward Washington, Oregon, and California down along the Baja. And that those radioisotopes released into the water uh, dissipate and are absorbed incredibly fast by phytoplankton, go through the food chain, get bioconcentrated all the way up to the bluefin tuna, but they don't just stay in the water. They get absorbed amazingly fast. For example, uh, if you give somebody radioactive strontium, radioactive cesium, the body literally devours it. The same thing goes on with bacteria. That's why we see these black, they call it black mold, black uh, mycobacteria around Japan and Tokyo. Those are signatures that there's radiation there, and they're bioconcentrating those radioisotopes. It's nature's response to try to sequester it very quickly and then to die and form a, a geological layer in the earth indicating this is when Fukushima happened. Yeah, there, there's a, a multitude of, of sources where it's coming from not only from the plants and it being steamed out of the ground around the plants, but the burning of the debris in Japan that's being trucked all over Japan. Uh, in fact, we had nine workers that passed out and were taken to the hospital at one of these incinerator facilities last week. I believe it was in Cantu. Um, and uh, several of them died from myocardial infarction. Yeah. So well, that's, that, that's how the, the seawater that is come, that is um, being you know with being poured onto the reactors and pouring into the ocean. A lot of the storms that hit our west coast are being generated out of this radiation slick that's moving across the ocean. Exactly, and there's also at least that way. The other thing is when you pour really uh, hot water on top of a urinal, uh, hot radioactive uh, fuel rods, uranium fuel rods, you form what's called uranium urinal ion. Uh, buckyballs, and those buckyballs can carry up to 64 uranium ion isotope uh, inside those buckyballs that literally float on the surface of the water and can bounce through the air up to anywhere up to 300 miles inland. Their heaviest area, of course, is within 5 to 7 miles of the, of the coast area, so there's a radiation plume that's created by buckyballs. So that is one of the aerosolized areas, and those can carry some pretty heavy isotopes like uh, uh, strontium, cesium, americium, uh, etc. The other major thing that's happening is the several of these um, ion radioisotopes, I radio iodine 131 and xenon 133, directly contribute to the chemical degradation of the upper atmosphere. Now, I've tried to explain to people out there, and they still adhere to this stupid idea that, and it really is the only other word for it is stupid, is that you can't float a brick in a pool. And chlorofluorocarbons have never created one drop of ozone degradation, but hydrogen sulfide and sulfur dioxide that come from volcanoes and from other oceanic volcanoes or burps of methane hydrate. Methane hydrate is often accompanied by sulfur dioxide. Methane hydrate itself, methane is also a, a relatively heavier gas, so it, it's very unlikely to get to the upper atmosphere. It breaks down into into uh, CO2. And CO2 is not bad. It degrades, it turns into, uh, into oxygen if you have enough benthic layer phytoplankton to make up 80% of the oxygen. But what is really bad is the radioiodine and xenon-133 do get into the upper atmosphere and they chew up the ozone layer, which is why we're having what's called radiation shock here on the ground level with high-level ground-level radiation from the ultraviolet light getting through. A, a is, is basically suntan, B is burn, C is cancer, and D is death. Uh, C and D are so powerful to go right through clothing, D will actually go right through the side of a building. So people need to be aware that these high-level radiation, like cosmic background radiation, radiation zeta particles, uh, microwaves actually come from space, go right through uh, clothing and buildings, and even on a cloudy day, the high energy light that can cause cancer, you aren't even aware because it's not even warm, actually can cause cancer right through your clothing. And it doesn't just cause cancer of your skin, it can cause immune suppression. So if you're getting exposed to ILO by C and D, because the ozone layer is thin because of Fukushima, you can come down with leukemia, you come down with breast cancer, bowel cancer, because your immune system is suppressed systemically from higher energy ultraviolet light. That's how scary this is. Mm -hmm. Well, all, all these things that we've, uh, you know, been taught over the years, um, you know, being healthy, avoiding the sun, um, you know, don't eat processed foods, don't eat fast foods, reduce stress, 
and those were all important things to heed, but now it's essential if you want to live. You have to really become an advocate for your own health. And you're not going to get a lot of help from doctors because they seem clueless about this. They're not yeah. trained to well, uh, report on radiation too. effects after the Cold War ended. They stopped including that in their curriculum. So this is a, almost a, you know, a whole new uh, avenue for them to learn about as well. If they had a drug that could supposedly protect against radiation, you can guarantee the doctors would get trained on how to recognize at the lowest threshold possible so they could push the drug. But because right. they don't have a, a possible drug, now we have a radiation protocol, and I'm going to repeat the core protocol we have a special on, includes two NIOSH N95 masks. It contains the diatomic neutrodyne, the Edgar Casey diatomic iodine that will protect your mitochondria. From mit and mitochondrial genesis stops. You stop making new mitochondria if you get radiation shock from radio iodine 131. It also protects your thyroid gland because the key thing for your natural killer cells is decreased mitochondrial function. So, you know, I can predictably tell you what I expect to happen as the population gets more and more gradual bioaccumulation and the zone of extreme toxicity increases in Japan and then the now, the level of radiation increases here. For example, I expect that within five years, at increasing burps of radiation, the level of radiation is in, in the United States will be equivalent to what it is in northern Japan within five years. That, that's even a, a very modest uh, guess. In terms of Japan, if there's major releases, they should be evacuating now. They shouldn't be thinking about evacuating. There should be evacuations of northern Japan now. They should immediately try to not put this in a sarcophagus, but Kevlar spider silk tents, build a corium catcher, seawalls, and start a circulation system where they cannot make millions of tons of radioactive water and pump it into the Pacific, but turn, but pull up the isotopes, turn it into a solid waste, and then take it in special radioactive container ships to put in the bottom of a zinc mine, or tin mines, which are the deepest mines on Earth, well below the water table, uh, where it can be entombed forever. But, this situation is uh, going to get it's going to get a lot worse before it becomes catastrophic. Right, right, and all those um, all those predictions are only if Fukushima stays exactly the way it is now. We don't have any more well, cool that lose cooling. Exactly. Fuel fire. Let's go through each one of them. Reactor number one, two, three, four, and five and six, of course. Then there's seven storage sites on there. Cooling pool four is the worst right now because if the seal breaks, no amount of pumps will work. And two weeks ago, they lost the uninterruptible power supply and jury rigged a supposedly temporary power supply. Not a good situation. Back in a moment. FukushimaFacts.com, Christina Consola. Welcome back, and uh, Christina, let's go over some of the uh, interesting things on FukushimaFacts.com uh, and some of the links, I think, in this uh, area. Now, also your show, they want to listen to Nuked Radio. How do they listen to your program? We're on the Orion Talk Radio Network. The show airs from noon to 1 Eastern Standard Time on Tuesdays and Thursdays. We originally did it for a month, um, starting the, the day after the one-year anniversary of Fukushima and it was to get people up to speed on Fukushima, the effects of radiation on, on health, and how to avoid it. And we had such a huge response, we decided to continue doing the show twice a week, and we will continue to do it as long as we can. Yeah, that's really good because uh, you, you're uh, super focused on this issue, so you're like a, a magnet for us. So I want to have you on the show regularly to give us updates, and you're an act super activist. We have a nuclear expert um, Chris Harris, but behind the scenes I have contacts on the ground in Japan uh, and here in, in America, which we won't mention, some of them are inside uh, various agencies. Uh, and what we're seeing is that quietly behind the scenes the government's in a big panic because we not only have, uh, we have multiple disasters. They're still using Corexit 9500 in the uh, Gulf of Mexico to suppress the continued leaks of methane hydrates and oil and tar because it was a tar volcano they drilled into at the Mukondo, which means the devil's food, that's literally the name of it, site at the uh, off the, the coast of New Orleans. We have continued release of, radio, of radioactive tar balls and other materials showing up there on the coast, and they're trying to suppress the oil, which is still seeping. On top of that, the Fukushima disaster is likely to release enough radiation. I was on the team years ago. We were monitoring whether we were going to get potassium iodate, which is all we had back then, 
if there was enough release of radiation from Chernobyl, and it came within a very, very close margin to issue everybody in Canada, because I was practicing in Canada at the time uh, before I came back to the States, uh, uh, potassium iodide to protect against thyroid failure. Now, what, what thyroid failure means is you're going to see not only thyroid cancer, you're going to see decreased IQs, you're going to see cortical atrophy, you're going to see strange behavior called decorticate behavior, you're going to see, along with the other radioisotopes like cesium and strontium, all kinds of things like blood cancers, uh, premature labor and uh, birth defects, trisomy, which is trisomic conditions 13, 18, and 21, which is Down syndrome, and now it's reported in Japan that up to five out of seven deliveries now in Japan are have birth defects or Down syndrome or other major anomalies. So, uh, I'm, I, and I'm very pro-life and I'm very concerned that we're, women now in Japan are having huge numbers of abortions and are frightened to get pregnant and even concerned about, quote, their own physical future, whether they're going to still be around. Well, they should be evacuating. And right now people are just sitting there like a deer in the headlights. So let's go over some of the details of just how crazy this is going to get. One million becquerels per kilogram of cesium was detected at a Fukushima school after it was decontaminated. That was reported by a local official posted on any news July 13th. One million becquerels yeah. was found in a, a fungus growing on some concrete by the door to the gymnasium. Now, you know that two weeks ago, Tuesday, they were supposed to reach the critical temperature at the fuel rod assemblies. Uh, Tuesday, Japanese Standard Time, JST 4 a.m., and uh, they averted it by literally within in hours on Sunday previous. They, quote, fixed the uninterruptible power supply with a temporary rig up. But what they don't tell you is that if the seal breaks on that full pooling pool, pool uh, fuel rod assembly area, that no amount of pumps will prevent that water level from dropping to the level where it reaches a critical temperature, which will cause the fuel rod assemblies to pop their corks like a bunch of champagne bottles sitting on the tarmac in Phoenix Airport at 115 to 120 degrees. So what will happen is these assemblies will pop their corks, and the amount of radiation will cause what's called sky shine, so much radiation that you won't even be able to service any of the areas in the entire area around it and that radiation plume, if it blows toward Tokyo, could cause an immediate environmental radiation disaster that is thousands of times more radiation than Nagasaki or Hiroshima without the explosion. One, one thing that I've repeatedly asked every expert that I've had on my show is, where's the corium? Why well, they, is anybody talking about the corium? We this, have they, ground penetrating radar, yeah, we have optical penetrating. coherence tomography, even heart under those plants, why isn't anybody talking about... Well, not, not just heart, there's a, there's a thing called torsion field imaging, and we had it actually from space in the 50s and 60s. So we saw these underground uh, dormant magma domes from old volcanoes, which is one of the favorite places to build underground cities around the world, because dormant magma domes can be anywhere from one half to 11, 12 cubic miles of size, anywhere from a mile and a half to five, six miles down, so it's ideal for building underground cities besides the matrix ones built by these high uh, speed uh, tunneling devices that use uh, sodium cooled nuclear reactors and an impact laser against the rock surface to create a, a literally a rock vapor that they can blow on the sidewalls and form an obsidian core. What they uh, have done is, is uh, they can actually visualize from spaces called torsion field imaging and they can actually identify not only an image but also the radioisotope characteristics from space up to 440, kilometers, 440 meters below ground, they can actually see and identify not only the shape, but the actual isotope analysis. So that's possible right now, but they're not showing and sharing anything. And if there are high, if there are high speed jets or drones or any other material being collected by the Japanese or America, nobody's, as they say in the mob in New Jersey, nobody's telling nobody nothing. Mm -hmm. they're, they're basically a, a complete blackout in, the, in this news statement is basically obscene. They don't want to have interview anybody like you, me, or any other experts on it. Uh, they don't want to interview uh, Chris Harris, who is one of the nuclear regulatory consultant, uh, top nuclear safety engineers in the United States out of about 40, and his team behind him, another 20-some, that actually collaborate on reports that we post up on our site and on our shows and on our live stream channel. They don't want to interview anybody just asking good questions like JASCO that they X'd out of the nuclear safety, and as a result, we're sitting wondering what the heck is going to happen next because we have officials that have what's called cranial rectal 
uh, insertion syndrome where their head is up their butt. And they don't want I'm us to see the light of day. Turn whistleblower. I hope so, too, because, you know, I, I don't see months away. I see weeks away from a major release. We know that there was a surge that was reported up on one of the blogs uh, back in March uh, or in April, and they thought, oh, that was released was a matter of a couple of days before, and actually it was May. And they thought it was in, in April that the release occurred, and actually it was back in March. It took six weeks for them to finally report it, and I tracked back the research and found that there was a, a track of radio iodine that was picked up uh, that had surged up to over 214 units compared to the background of something like 14 or 10 or something. And then it had dropped back, not to back to what it was before, but it dropped back considerably. So we know there's burps of radiation, and we, and by identifying this, the, which combinations, we can find out which part of Fukushima is doing it. You know, we'll focus on cooling pool four, but we've got criticality occurring in reactor number one because there's been neutron beams coming out of there ever since the beginning when it was sitting on a fault line and it broke the reactor core. We know reactor number two has had problems with the gauge going in the same direction, all the broken gauges where it's getting hotter and hotter. Reactor three, everything's blown to pieces because it's a MOX reactor, and, and a lot of that radioisotopes and fuel rod assemblies were blown miles away. And uh, it's, by the way, the plutonium reactor, which is 40,000 times more toxic than uranium. Uh, and we have no idea where those tunneling, uh, we call steam jets, are going, because they could be, with ground penetrating radar, we could tell if they're connected to high-speed uh, underground tunnels in the north of Tokyo, going from 20, 30, 40, 60, maybe 100 kilometers. Could be going out under the ocean and venting under the oceans. No one's doing water sampling down there or taking small submersibles to see if there's venting or bubbling of radioisotope, uh, literally steam-generated gas at deep uh, depths up to a mile or more off the coast of Japan. Nobody's sampling the sand or water or air sampling along the entire Japanese coast because they call it a thing called coastal effect where it not only goes out to sea, it pushes it laterally north and south so all of the coast of, of the east coast of Japan is becoming completely radioactive. Mm -hmm. It's a coastal effect. We talked about this with uh, uh, our other nuclear experts uh, on the program, so we need to get so you back on regularly. From the Manhattan Project, John Boseman, who had said recently that he had estimated the corium probably wouldn't melt more than a half mile into the earth, but you know, it's sitting right next to the sea. At this point, we could have an open conduit to the ocean. We don't know. But my guess is we brought our ground penetrating radar and these other technologies in we find the corium is at least uh, 40 to 60 meters below ground and it's venting out because it's in the water table high, superheated tritiated steam which is creating tritium and other radioisotopes into the ocean and many miles away connecting with the tunneling systems for the high-speed underground trains in Tokyo that's why we have Tokyo YouTube reports of radiation We'll have you back on regularly, Christina. Amazing program, FukushimaFacts.com and Nuke Radio. Listen to it. Check out her blog. <laughs>